Hi, good evening. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank Endocrine Society of India for this wonderful opportunity. Many thanks, especially to Dr. Nitin and Dr. Saptrishi and also Professor uh, Ganpati Pantwal. So my topic today is autoimmune region of endocrine disorders and uh, autoimmune endocrinology. Well, in fact, if we have a immune mediated destruction or a dysregulation of a tissue, endocrine tissue that can lead to an endocrine disorder, which can be, you know, it's, it's among the commonest endocrine disorder. You, you look at the commonest endocrine disorder, you, the first thing which will pop into your mind is an autoimmune thyroid disease, either a hypo and a hyperthyroidism. And another probably the commonest one would be, uh, among the commoner ones would be a type 1 diabetes mellitus. So, you know, uh, if you look at a journey of any endocrine, any autoimmune disorder, whether it is autoimmune endocrine disorder, any endocrine disorder, it basically begins with that genetic susceptibility on the top of it, there is an epigenetic event or a trigger or a, which can be environmental, infectious, whatever you call it, followed by a development of a serological autoimmunity, the process which sets in, goes on, followed by a destruction of a tissue significant enough or a dysregulation of a tissue significant enough to cause a metabolic abnormality, which will manifest as an overt disease. So this is the process. And, and, and I just went back about 25 years ago to you know, this particular picture shared by the ADA in 96. And this, this shows that just the correlation with number of antibodies and the time for the onset of diabetes. So, so if you see, if the person has three autoantibodies present, there's about uh, only 20% after a follow-up of about six and a half to seven years are, are non-diabetic compared to nearly 50% with two antibodies and nearly 70% with, with only one antibody. So, so the point I'm trying to make is that there are multiple factors besides only the presence of an antibody, which may basically uh, governs this. Not only this one particular antibody, then the quantum of antibody, then the interaction of the host versus environment, all those factors take place to generate a significant amount of dysfunction, which can lead to a disease or a disorder. Um, though we often talk about diabetes and thyroid, the type one diabetes and autoimmune thyroid as the commonest things, but, but if you go beyond that, there are a number of other endocrine disorders which have autoimmune origins. You can, we can talk about lymphocytic hypophysitis, either interior hypophysitis or the, or the infundibulo or neuroinfundibulo hypophysitis where initially you have a mass effect and subsequently you have a chronic um, hypopituitarism which is developing over a period of time. And we know that it's an autoimmune origin typically happening in a postpartum female most commonly. So, you know, and you can, of course, go on to talk about another uh, disorder with a very common endocrine uh, uh, and, and uh, a very common autoimmune origin, that's an Edison's disease. We know that in this part of country, tuberculosis and fungal diseases still remain a pretty common cause. But overall, if you look at the, uh, the autoimmunity is perhaps the most commonest cause of, of Edison's disease. And then non-traumatic hypoparathyroidism, probably autoimmunity is the most common cause of non-traumatic hypoparathyroidism. Same is the situation you can think about, say, about support primary gonadal insufficiency, specifically a primary premature ovarian failure, you know, where apart from many other causes like environmental toxins, et cetera, you can also talk about, you know, an autoimmune origin for the same. And, 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 and enough to mention here that this is probably most commonly is a, as a premature ovarian failure and very, very rarely or rather uncommon on the testes, predominantly, basically the, the blood testes barrier is something which is preventing probably over there. And we know that, you know, there are many, uh, with the target organs, there are many antigens and which lead to pro probably the production of antibodies. And we all know about the thyroperoxidase and the thyroglobulin antibody, and also about the TSH receptor antibodies, which are involved in the Graves or disease or the Graves or pitopathy. And similarly, in the pituitary, you can talk about number of antibodies, uh, adrenal glands, the, the Edison's, the 21 hydroxylase antibodies, this, the are supposed to have a very high prognostic value or, or for the eventual development of, of Edison's disease. And similarly for parathyroid, the calcium sensing receptor antibodies are there. Uh, the type 1 diabetes antibodies, almost all of you are very much aware about it, right? From say GAD65 antibodies to eyelid cytoplasmic antigen antibody to IA22 and zinc transporter rate antibodies. So when do we think about genetic origins? We all see, you know, patients of autoimmune thyroid disorders, type 1 diabetes, very, very commonly in our OPDs, almost on a daily basis, right? So when do we start thinking about a, about a, a core genetic origin in this? So whenever we have a clustering 
of autoimmune endocrinopathies. That is where you'll see in the same individual or in the same family, that is where you think about a genetic predisposition. It is more commonly polygenic, very rarely monogenic. More commonly polygenic, so you know, difficult to pinpoint. Uh, the, there, are, there are many factors and the presentation of course, like in any polygenic inheritance will be very much variable. We will have a very variable phenotypic presentations. But even in the monogenic picture, with the same gene, same mutation within the same family also, there is a lot of variability. So suggesting the thing that probably it is not only the genes which is playing a part, but a number of other factors also which are determining the eventual phenotype which the patient is going to have or eventual presentation which the patient is having. Overall, just to differentiate clinically with a polygenic versus a monogenic, if you have a onset or average age of onset, of the, of the disease that in a monogenic would probably be happening much early. Uh, the only example you can think of is an autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type one, which of course first comes into mind with a monogenic inheritance of a autoimmune regulator gene, average on age of onset younger. And then you many times have a, you know, specific, a, spec, a specific, you know, conglomerate of signs and symptoms or a syndromic presentations where you find that, for example, like I was talking about APS1, where you think that, okay, candidiasis, hypoparathyroidism, and, 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 and is it a part of it? So similarly, you know, these hallmarks can give you a clue more about a monogenic rather than a polygenic, which will have an even more variable presentation, even though monogenic can also have variability in terms of extent of disease and the age of onset and the progression of the disease over a period of time. But overall in monogenic, especially the genetic diagnosis can be more helpful in guiding management and can give an insight into prognosis, inform the families of the recurrence risk and facilitate even the prenatal diagnosis. So why do the why do the immune disorders help they happen? So we talked a bit about it, just a little bit. Overall, our body's immune system is you know trying to walk a tightrope walk, when you know it's trying to balance at the when end, you know trying to retain its potential to mount an immune response against a pathogen, and at the same time trying not to act against any of the self antigens. This happens through a complex process, and I'm not going to the details of the complex process. But overall, uh, when you look when you look at this, what happens is the the loss of immune tolerance, the immune tolerance which is there, which basically prevents those T cells to you know go on and and uh, create a cascade of inflammatory cytokines, which eventually lead to gland destruction. There is a dysregulation at that level, as a result of which you have a situation where a destruction happens, a dysfunction happens, and eventually the disease happens over a period of time. So a complex inheritance with often the involvement of you know, uh, HLA in MHC chromosome six complex. But, but since we know that in, in, in identical twins also, there is you know, not 100% concordance, which suggests that this is not, the genetic is not the only answer and probably environmental factors play a role. And if we want to look at it, no further or the, or the easier example to look at a celiac disease where you, know, you have a HLA-DR3 associated immunity, which is triggered by a wheat protein gliadin exposure. So, you know, a number of external factors like, you know, viral infections, bacterial infections, psychosocial factors play a role in the cascade, but, but on their own also, only environmental factors may not lead to it. That has also been shown by, you know, uh, people living in the same family with the same genotype and uh, even the twins and similar environmental exposures, but not going on to develop the disease. Uh, there is a difference over there. So, so there is much more than that. And probably our understanding is go going to evolve more and more as we, as we, uh, as we learn more and more about these disorders. And even though most of the genetics and other, other work in this field has predominantly been done in last one, one and a half decade. And, and so fair enough to say that probably another decade down the line, we will be much more wiser while talking about these disorders. So, you know, there are certain HLA which are more closely associated with certain diseases. We know that, you know, with celiac, a DR3, DR2, DQ8, et cetera, and, and all the common which, you, which, you, uh, which are easily available online. So uh, what about the environmental factors? Well, these are all postulated factors with associated diseases, right? So, you know, you can always think about a selenium deficit with an autoimmune thyroid disease. You can always talk about a smoking with a Graves orbitopathy. You can always talk about say, bacterial infections or maybe a cow's milk allergy or a cow's milk exposure leading to a type one diabetes, et cetera. But, you know, and, and then some drugs which can actually lead to that. But, you know, many of them uh, have a very, very, uh, not a strong uh, causative, associ causative relationship, but yes, uh, nevertheless, a significant association for many of them, which is there.
So coming to one important disorder, which is an autoimmune polyglandular disorder, what are they? So when we have two or more auto, autoimmune endocrine disorders within the same individual, that's an APD, right? Which, which can be Graves, which can be Hashimoto's, which can be type one, which can be Addison's, which can be premature hypogonadism. So classically, the, the classification has been this in this way where we have a type one with an autoimmune regulated monogenic inheritance pattern, uh, also sometimes called as APECED disease or, or you know, with, uh, with uh, most commonly a uh, two out of three things like chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, hypoparathyroidism, and Addison's followed by, you know, APS2 with type 1 diabetes, autoimmune thyroid disease, or Addison's. Then we have an APS3, which basically has an autoimmune thyroid disease plus any of the four components, which can be, you know, you can talk about endocrinopathies as a 3A, as it's associated with GI disorders, 3B, association with skin, hematopoietic, or nervous system disorders like vitiligo, alopecia, thrombocytopenia, et cetera, as 3C, or 3D with collagenopathies, connective tissue disorders, et cetera. And then aggregation of any of those two not fitting into this basically has been broadly clubbed as APS4. Well, well, this has been slightly, you know, uh, some some uh, researchers have put put it up differently. Uh, Doctor ha Professor Hattersley's group in Exeter has has put it as more like a, you know, juvenile versus an adult, and I'll talk about it. But typically, you know, APT one or the monogenic one with autoimmune regulatory gene on chromosome twenty one, that's basically having an autosomal recessive inheritance with, you know, early presentation and and significant component of mucocutaneous candidiasis. When you talk about type two, that is autoimmune polyglandular uh, disease type two, it's basically, you know, people have, we have always been talking about Addison's, but the latest research is showing that type one diabetes perhaps is among the commonest component of APT type two and the most frequent comb combinations are type one along with autoimmune thyroid disease followed by uh, autoimmune thyroid disease and Addison's disease. So, 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 you know, uh, that is why, you know, the, the recommendation is that the patients even with monoglandular autoimmune disease should be serologically screened for, for APD2 every three yearly interval until the age of 75. Why has this recommendation came? This has recommend, this recommendation is on the basis of this particular study of 15,000 consecutive patients in a tertiary endocrine outpatient clinic in Germany, where they looked at all patients with monoglandular autoimmune disorders, and they tried to find the, the prevalence of other ones. So they found that the prevalence is nearly 1%. And on basis of this, the recommendation came. Now, on basis of where you practice, what are the resources you have, and we can always prioritize what exactly is our priority in terms of giving the best possible optimum care for our patients. So, um, so you know, overall, the juvenile versus the adult, the classification, as I was talking about, proposed by Professor Hattersley's group, talks about a childhood or an adult onset with, you know, uh, with an adult onset probably more associated with organ-specific antibodies and juvenile more associated with interferon-associated antibodies. A significant component of hypoparathyroidism in the juvenile and an autoimmune thyroid and type 1 diabetes in the adult onset disease. So overall, in the juvenile, a, a nearly 80% of patients also have a mucocutaneous candidiasis with almost a similar or slightly lower number of patients have a component of primary adrenal insufficiency also. So important to remember is that one presentation and the subsequent presentation in the same individual, the time interval can be variable and it can be huge. So, you know, that is why it's important to do a regular long-term follow-up of the patients. And, and familial clustering is very, very common. That's why, you know, uh, because of the high incidence of the similar problems in the first degree relatives, the family members also need to be regularly screened for any of the autoimmune endocrinopathies. And we know that there are some many other non-endocrine disorders which can be a part of it, which can give a clue, for example, myasthenia, celiac, pernicious anemia, vitiligo, alopecia, etc. So, so the objective of screening is that we want to detect patients early. We want to detect patients many times before, at the time uh, before the onset of an overt metabolic defect, at the time of you know, serological abnormality, or even earlier uh, if possible. So, so you know the advantage obviously is that we are able to you know uh, give better outcomes to the patient, treat the disease at a, at a le much less severe spectrum, and you know um, bet, uh, more effective therapy can be given for the patients. So you know we we know that there are different types of antigens and different types of tissues which we can talk about. And uh, you all know the, about the antibodies associated with type 1, thyroid, Addison's, hypopara, and immune gastritis. But overall, 
if if there is a uh, if we just look at the data of you know all patients with autoimmune poly, uh, polyglandular disease type 2 and you look at what is the prevalence of antibodies you find that probably you know thyroid and the parietal cell antibodies are perhaps the commonest right so you have a thyroperoxidase antibody nearly 80% parietal cell and thyroglobulin antibodies nearly to the tune of 50% and tsh receptor antibody to the tune of 40 48 50% followed by the antibodies against the insulin and the gat component so you know so you know uh, these thyroid antibodies as we know they can be positive for years together and in contrast to the antibodies against you know the the islet cells or other the thyroid antibodies it can be decades before there is a progression to over disease but when you look at antibody against a steroidal enzyme like a 21 hydroxylase like a gonadal enzymes etc that basically is of a higher prognostic value and does help in identifying patients at a higher risk of developing an addison's disease in the future so you know uh, how many first degree relatives nearly 20% of first degree relatives of patients with a polygenic inheritance of of autoimmune polyglandular disease type 2 do have an unrecognized endocrine disorder that's why routine screening in them is recommended and and we know that once you have antibodies against specific components uh, you know you can screen those things specific for those components and in the interest of times i'll just straight away go to this yes. so you know once you have an antibody against a thyroid you can obviously screen with the thyroid function test and then go according to that similarly a calcium sensing receptor antibody is positive you can look at the calcium profile the pth values as required and if there is a antibodies against an islet cells like a islet cell anti you know or a, or, a, or a zinc transporter we can do a gtt and see what is happening over there similarly for a 21 hydroxylase antibodies we can do a cortisol we can do an acth and see where the patient stands if there is an insufficiency already happening we can treat if there is a dysfunction but without a clinical disease setting in you know we can do a synactin stimulation test and maybe we can put the patient on a sick regimen uh, sick day regimen earlier similarly you know 17 hydroxylase antibodies we can look at the other parameters for autoimmune hypogonadism and for parietal cell antibodies we can do the workup accordingly as well as for the uh, anti uh, anti tissue transglutaminase antibodies psychosocial morbidity has been pretty significant because you know many of those patients have seen some family members having a uh, many multiple disorders and uh, and when you start screening that's a problem which happens because they are aware that there's something which can which they also can develop but they may or may not develop and it leads to a significant impairment in terms of quality of life uh, and psychosocial status overall you know in involvement of first degree relatives especially in the classical autoimmune polyglandular diseases is pretty prevalent so what about monogenic i'm not going to spend too much time on this but you know we talked about apd type 1 and we know that uh, there's this, this classical you know spectrum a classical you know conglomerate of presentation which gives a clue similarly the classical conglomerate of presentation gives a clue so for example if you look at the uh, the x linked uh, polyendocrinopathy auto uh, enteropathy the fox p3 you have a conglomeration of a severe enteropathy with a problematic eczema in a type 1 diabetic that basically will give you a clue against that right so similarly you know you can have a conglomerate in in other presentations like a common variable immunodeficiency etc so to summarize it's basically a defect in one of the genes of the hla locus and and the genetic susceptibility is is necessary but not not everything it's not the whole story as we can see from the data with lack of concordance like lack, lack of wholehearted concordance in identical twins right on the top of that when there is an environmental insult followed that triggers the cascade and that cascade sometime down the line can lead to the development of autoimmunity can lead to the development of a process leading to dysfunction or a dysregulation of gland and an eventual metabolic defect when we talk about autoimmune polyglandular polyglandular disorder it basically includes two at least two autoimmune endocrine disorders and even in monoglandular autoimmune diseases serological screening is recommended and once you have a positive serological screening as i showed we can do a functional screen in that case autoimmune destruction can be a fairly slow process and can last for years and years and the interval can between first and the second presentation can be very much variable as we have seen from the data with autoimmune polyglandular disorders and this basically this period can be used to identify asymptomatic individuals who are at risk so long term follow up is recommended and there is a significant component of a psychosocial morbidity in these patients thank you so much i would be very happy if there are any questions back